Good morning. So I am Miguel Valzerabano from Methodist Hospital. We just had a great grand rounds presentation by Dr. Matliski in our Methodist Debakey uh, Heart and Vascular Center grand rounds. And um, we are going to be chatting um, along the lines of what we had discussed today in grand rounds, which is the challenges of non ischemic cardiomyopathy. And uh, Frank, first, thank you for your excellent overview. And, um, you know, going over what you discussed today, um, obviously there's a lot of challenges in, in scientific challenges in the management of, of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, but uh, more on a personal uh, note, uh, what I'm most impressed is how you've managed to, over 35 years, keep a very busy practice, uh, um, a very busy and successful uh, training program, and while keeping the academic productivity and, and keeping the overall view of, okay, what your mission is, what you're going to do with the field, and, and, and uh, you've been incredibly successful at that, and I'm just impressed, and I would like to get some tips as to how to manage that uh, triple mission. Well, I don't know if I can offer tips to you. You've done very well. So, so but I, I can tell you this. I think some of this is I've been lucky to have good mentoring. Mm -hmm. You know, I had Mark Josephson as a, as a, my inspiration, and one thing that he he made people feel that they had the absolute responsibility to continue through their life to inch this field forward. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, we don't get make Nobel Prize changes, but I think we do try to inch the field forward and answer clinically relevant questions. So I give him credit for inspiring me and. and basically inspiring everybody they worked with to have that confidence and that sort of the sense of responsibility that they needed to do this, whatever they did. So that, that's part one. And the second part is I clearly got lucky and surrounded myself by an incredible talent. And yeah. I think when you do that, it just you know, buoys the whole, sh whole ship and, and, and uh, everything stays afloat and everything yeah. moves forward. And it, I've been lucky. So, do you think the paradigm is 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 going to survive as as medicine evolves more towards a business driven or a corporate management style uh, dri driving our practices? Well, I, I think it's a challenge. I think that what has to be incorporated into that strategy is the fact that what moves the field, what changes it in terms of the development and progress, what ultimately generates additional revenue yeah. is the scientific development. So, and, and I think what we can't do is bin science into the laboratory and away from the cl clinician and away from the people that know the questions that need to be answered. We, we need to make sure that we answer physiologic questions, mm -hmm. address clinical problems, that are apparent by busy clinicians and try to Im have immediate impact on moving this field forward. N not the 40-year the plan, but yeah. make observations, make physiologic assessment that has an impact on new ideas and new techniques that are meaningful in the, over the next several yeah. years. That, that, is, that is a continuous challenge that all institutions face. Um, we've had here, um, as you will see in a few minutes, the, this Methodist Research Institute, which has, is a big facility with uh, top-notch investigators and the continuous challenge is to get each other engaged in, in a conversation so that we get their help, they get our help, and it's just very hard when you have a busy clinical practice. Yeah. And, and, and uh, well, I think um, you're, you're research operation has been pretty much independent. You've run it and, and you've had the resources and the staff and the people and the talent to, to succeed. Do you see uh, collaboration with more basic scientists ever feasible in, in a research operation like yours? Um, well, the end, we don't do enough. Yeah. I mean, just like everybody else, we always look and say, wh wh where are our bioengineers? Where are our basic scientists? How can we get them to to pay attention. When we do collaborate, hmm. it's actually been fantastic. They're usually saying, geez, wish we had known how important that was. Yeah. The issue is one time, I think our time now is 
being drained not only by our productivity clinically, which is you know a little bit more rigorously scrutinized, but and and required. But I, I think it's also you know we're the burden of all physicians now with paperwork that's that's yeah. incredibly cumbersome. So you know we, we I think it gets a little bit easier as we sort of recognize that we have to carve out time and it's important. And some of this we we what we all do is make it part of our hobby in life, right? So it's nights yeah. and weekends yeah. and, and, and a lot of effort to, to try to pull this off. The problem is the collaboration with those basic scientists. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think we do enough of it. I think it needs to be emphasized. I think there was this movement to translational science that then still gets binned. And, and rather than I think it's, it's I see that it's, it has not, it's became a buzzword, yeah. but it's, it's very hard to make it uh, a reality, especially, I think especially because the, the scientists are also working in a corporate mode and their yeah. goal is to get their grants and to get yeah. their, and, and collaborating with clinicians may be a risky operation. Uh, yes. A few words about uh, training. Uh, so you lead, um, arguably, uh, what, what I think subjectively is the best training program in the world in EP, and you've done so for, for many years or decades. Um, would you have any advice for us that we are starting our own training program uh, in terms of realistic goals, how much research to emphasize, um, how much uh, focused on the procedural aspect of our specialty, which has become predominant, to get a balanced, uh, committed individual, especially along the lines of what you were saying, that to get people to make contributions, you have to have this sense of responsibility, that yeah. they, their mission is not just to take care of patients, but also. Yeah, well, I, I always call myself a good cheerleader. So, okay. so I spend almost every day trying to get people excited about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Some of the people see that I'm still like a, Kid yeah. being excited about what most of what we do, so it gets a little bit easy. We, you know, you have to have a, a format that provides availability. We meet yeah. every morning, and one of the reasons we meet every morning is just so they know they always have contact with me. They yeah. always have access, and then we do it on a case-based focus. But I say whenever we have a case that where we are challenged and we disagree, I try to stop everybody and tell them, well, why are we disagreeing? Is there a way to investigate this? Mm -hmm. And what should we do? And then when I turn to the fellows and say, we have 20 cases like this or 30 cases like this, I want you to, to look at it. And I want you to come. So we try that process. I think it does work. It's not perfect. Everybody struggles. But I think it's, you, you, it, unless everybody makes the effort, and, and again, I'm, I'm blessed by having a lot of other people hmm. that have the same, same interest and pick up, pick up the slack when I'm here in Houston. No, but the idea that you make um, the making of an academic contribution part of the clinical care or part oh, of the discussions of it. No, I, and I tell the fellows, listen, your fellowship incorporates a research training experience. As far as I'm concerned, your research training, your fellowship experience is not satisfactory if you don't have that, yeah. if you don't do a good job. So start early. Think about what you want to do and see something right through its completion and mm -hmm. publication. And you should and take that as seriously as you will your effort to become skilled at the procedures that we're going to teach. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's all important. Procedural skills are, are, are definitely uh, have, I think, overshadowed the, the training experience in yeah. EP. We used to emphasize, we still emphasize training in, in tracing interpretation and differential diagnosis based on electrograms. And I hear this disconnect in a lot of our fellows that, you know, in, when we meet in, in formal teaching conferences, it's all about, you know, differential diagnosis based on tracing. And then the actual practice is, is all about catheter navigation in the 3D structure of the yeah. heart. So it's, it's quite a challenge to balance both. Um, yeah, but I, and again, I think you're, you're right, and it's a challenge for everybody. You're not alone in hmm. that experience. A and I think what we, I, I always just say, look, this is the time to push, shift some of, some of the responsibility to the fellows early on. Yeah. You know, to be able to review and to know what the uh, steps would be to determine a correct diagnosis in the EP laboratory, not burning and then learning, but yeah. rather 
learning first and yeah. then burning after you make the correct diagnosis. So I, I think it just needs to be continue to be emphasized. It will get overshadowed. That the, just think, think about the technological skills that we've developed yeah. have been so exciting for all of us. I mean, I'm looking at the old timers say, look at this has been blessed to be still in the game. Yeah. And, and be excited about it because it's been fun. I mean, don't, don't, don't want to short sell that, that effort either because yeah. it's been great to be able to, to yeah. achieve that technical proficiency. It is true that, that you know, our field is eminently um, determined by the technology we have in our hands. And, and that takes me to the next question that I wanted to ask you is, how do you see the role of industry uh, partnering with us, you know, this gets somewhat penalized and demonized as something bad, but the truth is that industry uh, partners with us for, yeah. you know, to make very meaningful contributions, and right now to make, a, to have a viable research operation, you need funding. Right. Um, government funds, uh, federal funds, uh, do not really particularly emphasize practical aspects of clinical management, um, and for that we need to, the industry, where do you see that going, and especially well, in the sense well, of conflicts of interest? Yeah, and so no, I, I think two things. One is that we part, there, as you said, they are our partners. Mm -hmm. We are technology-driven subspecialty. We must have those partners to continue to progress. I think that we're obligated, as everybody in medicine, to disclose all the information mm -hmm. so that people can be aware of relationships. I think we should not be as balanced as we can with every type of presentation and publication so that we're not at risk for you know, being looked at as mm -hmm. having a specific preference. I think that we also need to be very careful when we ha have the potential for any personal gain to try to avoid it if we're gonna have these links. Yeah. But to have them to support education and research and product development it's actually, it, it can't get any better. Yeah. Yeah. And they should be our partners for this. It's a win-win for both, in both camps. It's, you know, I totally agree with that. In, in AFib, atrial fibrillation, which is a disease where, as we have discussed before, the, we have mechanistic challenges as well as technical yeah. challenges. Um, I do see a little bit of, a, of a industry overemphasizing the technical developments as opposed to working with us in figuring out mechanistic understandings that would help us better treat the disease. Yeah. And, and it's funny because I, I remember having a discussion with some big shots from industry about this and well, they said, well, the mechanisms is for you guys to figure them out, we'll just give you uh, tools. Right. Well, I mean, I think both, both are true, right? So you, yeah. you, you, they, they don't have the expertise we have the responsibility to emphasizing mechanism, but the biggest developments in electrophysiology have always, been, some of it's been serendipitous and mm. some of it's been, been you know, fortuitous, but a lot of it has been by the study of mechanisms. Yeah. And I think until we figure out mechanistically how to do things based on physiology, based on the science, it's then it's speculative, it's empiricism. Yeah. And empiricism in the long run may get lucky, but then you have to accept the fact that half the time it will fail. Yeah. And, and should all, if you're based on strong science, then you know, the odds are that you're going to progress and it's going to be a positive effect. So it's worth the investment. My mentor, again, I want to emphasize <laughs> that, uh, my, my uh, influence of Mark Josephson because he was always, there wasn't a day that didn't go by that he, he didn't talk about mechanisms. <laughs> Well, Frank, thank you for coming. Um, My pleasure. Your presentation will be available in the YouTube channel, and I guess this interview too. And thank you.